another child, did you feel the decision was uh, was going to be as it turned out, given the makeup of the court, or did you have some doubts? Well, um, we were very confident that we had a great case and we thought we were going to win. Now, you never go into it presuming anything. So, no, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't presumptuous to say, oh, of course we're going to win. I mean, I thought we would win, but you never know. You know, uh, courts do weird things, juries, uh, it's not a jury case, but they also can be unpredictable. And so, no, we handled it like, like uh, you know, as though it mattered what we, what we said and did, and, and uh, that's the way you have to approach every case. So, I, I don't think that we were, we were cocky. I will say this, though. Uh, there was a lot of criticism about whether to do the case, and here is why I, I, I think I have to address this. Um, it wasn't really optional for us to do a case like, like Heller. Uh, at the time that we filed the Heller case, we had already seen uh, a circuit split. Uh, the Fifth Circuit the previous year before we started planning the case, uh, in a case called uh, U.S. versus Emerson, had held for the first time that, that there is, in fact, a Second Amendment individual right. Uh, once you have federal courts of appeal disagreeing with each other about what the Constitution means, that's a huge red flag to the Supreme Court. That's exactly the kind of controversy that the Supreme Court is, is interested in hearing and designed to take. Uh, so um, uh, Clark Neely and Steve Simpson, two lawyers uh, at, at the Institute for Justice, friends of mine, great lawyers, saw this and they said, wow, okay, now there's a circuit split. It's obviously an issue that um, a lot of uh, people were very interested in. It was already burning up the, the law reviews. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about it, and uh, they felt that it was a good idea to create a case uh, that would handle the matter in, in the best, most responsible way possible so that we could get a good case up there if they wanted to hear it, as opposed to most of the other Second Amendment cases uh, historically, which have been, you know, U.S. versus bank robber or U.S. versus crackhead. Uh, you know, not, not really great platforms for the right to keep their arms, oftentimes not necessarily handled by subject matter experts, even though some of the lawyers, the lawyers are, are pretty good. Um, and, uh, and in fact, there were other cases they didn't get anywhere, but we were worried about them. Uh, at the time we, uh, uh, we filed uh, that case, in fact, um, shortly after uh, we filed what was then known as the Parker case, I went to the D.C. Circuit and heard an argument. There was a, a case called uh, U.S. versus Maple, I think, where somebody had raised a Second Amendment claim in the context of, I think he was a drug dealer of some kind, and, and the court found that he hadn't preserved his Second Amendment claim at the, at the trial level, but, but um, the judges there were very interested in, in, at the argument in the Second Amendment issue. Uh, there were other cases out there. I, I, you know, I don't remember all of them. I, I could, I could uh, discuss them with you, but you know, it wasn't optional. This was going to happen, okay? And so we tried to make it happen in the best way possible, not because we were sure we were going to win, but we were very sure that the issue would go up there one way or another, and we just wanted to make sure it got out there in, in, in a positive way. Um, next question. I've heard that there was a Supreme Court uh, decision before Heller that said that the right was not individual. Is there a, a chance Heller uh, can be overturned? Uh, in response to the first part, no, that's, the other side kept saying that, that's not true. Uh, there was a case called U.S. versus Miller, 1939, it was the only other Second Amendment case that had ever been taken up directly addressing the meaning of the Second Amendment. There were other cases that had mentioned the Second Amendment, but this was the only other real Second Amendment case. And in Miller you had a situation, it was a, a, a pair of bank robbers apparently uh, who had uh, shotguns that were a little bit too short for the National Firearms Act. Uh, without the benefit of a stamp, and uh, the question there was whether or not that shotgun was something that was within the meaning uh, of, of the Second Amendment. Uh, the uh, case was sent back to the trial court for a resolution of that question. Uh, they didn't decide the case one way or another. Obviously, if Mr. Miller uh, had a Second Amendment right to that sawed-off shotgun, he would have been acquitted. Uh, and, and by the way, I should mention, the case arose out in the highway. They were driving from uh, uh, Arkansas to Oklahoma. It didn't happen inside anybody's house. Obviously, if the Second Amendment's limited to the home, that wouldn't have been much of a case. It wouldn't have been heard. Uh, all the same, before the uh, lower court could do anything with the Supreme Court's opinion, uh, Mr. Miller was murdered. Perhaps he needed that gun anyway, uh, after all. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, but to say that Miller held that the Second Amendment is, is, is a collective right is erroneous, 
People have said that. Courts have said that they're wrong. If the Second Amendment had been held to be non-individual in that case, there would not have been a remand. Uh, it, would, it would have been a very different outcome. Uh, and then can it be overruled? Well, technically, yes. I don't think it will be. Um, you know, the, obviously, if you have five justices who are on the court who uh, dislike the opinion and want to change uh, their mind about it, then, of course, that's, uh, that, that's something that we have to, to worry about. I don't think practically that's going to happen. Uh, I think it's very tough to overrule uh, flat out an opinion like this, especially considering that the overwhelming majority of the public accepts it. I think what we have to be more worried about, though, is to have five justices who will uh, limit it out of existence. They, they won't overrule it, but they'll say, well, we're going to harmonize it. We're going to explain it. We're going to limit its reach. We're going to say different things. We're going to um, minimize it. And, you know, courts are very good at shrinking things without absolutely, uh, you know, striking them down entirely. So I, while I think an outright reversal is unlikely, we do have to be worried about who is uh, appointed and confirmed to the federal bench. And also, not just the Supreme Court, but also your lower federal courts are very important. The Supreme Court, remember, takes very few cases, and uh, it can only fix so much. If you have a, uh, a lower federal bench that is uh, committed uh, to, uh, to be hostile to your rights, then you know, the Supreme Court uh, can only swim against that for so long and, and only to, to such an extent. Um, I'm sure the justices would, wouldn't agree with that, but that's, that's the reality. Not every case is going to go to the Supreme Court. And so judges matter, and they, you know, they matter when you uh, go out to vote. Well, I would agree with that, um, but uh, I'm not sure that's the first argument I would bring to court. Uh, the Equal Protection Clause does not allow the government to treat people who are similarly situated differently. Uh, you cannot treat things that are um, alike differently. And what the courts would tell you, I believe, in that circumstance, and I, I've seen this in, in some other contexts, is they'll say, well, you know, retired police officers are, are special, they're different than you and I because they've had, you know, years of training and experience in carrying a gun, and so they're you know, they're not like, you know, like you and me. They have the benefit of all this, of all this extra uh, knowledge and uh, experience, and therefore to treat them differently uh, is, is, um, uh, is okay. They're not similarly situated. Also, I'm sure the argument can be made that, well, you know, they've been in law enforcement. They have, um, they've probably amassed uh, in their career a list of uh, displeased customers who might find them in their families someday. Blah, blah, blah. And again, you know, that, that's what the court would probably tell you. And I, I think the answer there is not so much to focus on whether we can all be treated equally, because, uh, you know, if push comes to shove, you know, perhaps the, the legislature would say, fine, nobody gets them. Uh, or, fine, uh, retired officers are also subject to may issue, but of course, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, they're going to get their permits because their good cause statements can be better than yours. I think the solution is simply to say, look, do you have the right to, to keep and bear arms? Yes, you do. Therefore, licenses must be issued to people who meet objective standards that are themselves constitutional. No more of this, you know, looking at people to see if they're good enough to have their rights.
Yeah, a lot of them are. I mean, we're going to find out, uh, you know, because they're all going to be litigated. <laughs> That's what the fun is, and you know, <laughs> we're 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 doing it. I mean, you know. I may not have heard that completely correctly, or that I don't really understand it entirely. Was this it was, it was the person that wrote that uh, want to clarify? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm sorry. I yeah, no, I want to say that maybe it wasn't the little thing. It's just the way the law is written is that if you're a criminal with a judgment that allows you to own a firearm legally, you know, uh, unbelievable. Thanks. Well, the semantic form of the way they're written, I think, is less important than 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 the, with with um, than their impact. I mean, if the impact is that law-abiding people aren't entitled to have a gun, subject to restrictions, if it's you, you know, then then uh, then you have a problem. Uh, even if you say, even if you don't have that presumption uh, of illegality. Um, but you still have that effect, that's still a problem. So I wouldn't focus so much about the form of it. But yeah, you're right. The form does suggest very strongly that there's a problem with that law. Because this is, again, something that is your right. So any law that starts out with, you have no right to do this, except indicates immediately to the court that the legislature had it backwards. And uh, that's a very strong signal that unless those exceptions are very broad and very presumptive, there are going to be some problems. And again, the devil's in the details. I can tell you there's a lot of things wrong with the way New Jersey does things. And um, you know, the, the fact it's discretionary is a problem. Uh, obviously, we're challenging that. And uh, there are going to be other issues as well, I'm sure. But uh, that, that, uh, that is going to be resolved by the court. Thank you. The next question is interesting. The 2005 federal gun-free school zone bans firearms within 1,000 feet of a school. My home is within that zone. How do I get to exercise my two-way rights without breaking federal law? I believe there are exceptions there for, for homeowners and also for people who are, who are licensed to carry. So if you have a state license to carry, or if it's your house, then I don't, I don't think, I, I don't believe, again, you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure there's language like that. And, um, you know, I haven't seen a whole lot of prosecutions uh, for that. Uh, of course, your, your big problem is that you don't, um, if you can't get the license, you know, you're, you're not going to fall within the exemption. So that is a problem. Um, has NRA's Project Exile to ensure felons with guns face federal charges worked in New Jersey? I don't know. I haven't studied that. Uh, it's, uh, Um, you know, always an interesting question. I get this a lot. You know, the thing about NRA, you have to remember, is it's, it's a very large organization. They do a lot of different things, and there are a lot of different uh, people and departments within it. And so their relationship with some aspects of, of NRA is good. Their relationship with other aspects of NRA is, is not good. Uh, it, it really depends on, on what we uh, talk about. I can tell you that the relationship with ILA is hostile and uh, not constructive. Uh, the relationship with other parts of NRA is, is good. Uh, uh, NRA does great things. I always encourage people to join that organization. I don't have a problem with it. I think they, they're, they're necessary and they do good things. But they're very, very territorial. And, and uh, I don't think they like it that other people are involved sometimes uh, doing these things. And so they, they get upset. <laughs> you know, what can I say? It's, that's, that's the reality, and and they're not um, they're not helpful sometimes. Okay, thank you. Uh, what type of test slash scrutiny do you foresee developing for barriers to uh, home gun ownership? What barriers will develop? Well, the other side is always going to try to develop barriers. What's important for us is to uh, develop. Uh, constitutional doctrine that's going to defeat those barriers, whatever uh, form those barriers take. And we've done that to a large extent with Heller. We've seen a lot of courts now say, even the ones that are very reluctant to uh, find uh, a Second Amendment right outside the home or under different circumstances, they always like to sort of go back to, to, to Heller and say, well, in the home is this, 
sort of holy, sacrosanct place, and of course you can't touch guns when they're in the home. And that's actually got a lot of precedent to it generally um, uh, in American law. Uh, you know, the Fourth Amendment has extra protection inside the home, uh, for example. The home is, is a place of additional protection under American law, and that's true of the Second Amendment as it is uh, with any other uh, part of the Constitution. Yes, yes, and, and they've already said that as if I've, as I've uh, discussed. It's already in Heller. Uh, all the sources that Heller relies upon confirm this as well, and so um, I expect that uh, so long as this current Supreme Court uh, gets that question, if they are faithful to the decisions they've already issued on the topic, we'll find that there is indeed such, such a right. No, I, uh, I don't like shout out questions when I'm in this, but, uh, uh, but I don't, was that question related to constitutional carry or not? It, it's, it's, well, I'll answer it anyway, but please, you know, we're, I, I, I do the format that the host tells me to do, so um, I don't, all right, you know, okay, because uh, I don't like that term, constitutional carry. I think it's a misleading term, and I don't think it's, I don't think it's, um, uh, it's a useful term. People usually say constitutional carry to refer to a, a system of law where uh, there are no regulations on the right to carry that, uh, at, for example, as in Arizona or Alaska or Vermont, uh, Wyoming, I think now has a version of this, although I think it's only for residents, uh, where you don't need a license to carry a gun openly or concealed. Um, uh, I don't believe that that is going to be something that the Supreme Court will find as a, as a Second Amendment matter uh, they've already referenced uh, many, many cases historically that have uh, allowed prohibitions on concealed carry, as I've discussed. So they're going to allow a measure of regulation, and they're going to allow licensing. And, you know, I'm a very libertarian person. I don't like a lot of licensing for a lot of things. But, you know, this country, the, the world we live in is not, you know, my personal utopia, and we're going to have licensing allowed, uh, so long as it's done objectively, so long as it's done in non-discriminatory fashion, so long as it's done fairly, uh, and so long as it's not a ruse by which to deny people their rights, licensing in and of itself is something that the state will be allowed to do to you. Now, some people don't like that, um, but that's the legal reality in which we live. You need licenses to do a lot of things in this country, and I suppose that uh, if you live in a place that wants to license the carrying of guns, then they will be um, allowed to get away with that, but again, of course, we are suing and we will continue to sue those places that abuse those laws to turn them into something that actually is a hindrance to your rights. So I, I don't know if that's the answer. Um, several states uh, besides New Jersey, uh, for instance, uh, Maryland, California, Illinois, New York, etc., have uh, some of them are farther along in the system than the, the Jersey states. Uh, do you have a feeling? Oh, I have no idea. This is always so tricky because, you know, your case could be going along and uh, then something happens. You know, for example, in California and indeed in the entire Ninth Circuit, everything is frozen. Uh, every time they get a gun case now, they're saying, oh, we can't decide it because Nordyke is out there. This is the, the gun show case that's going on Bonk now for the second time. And I always joke with my good friend Don Kilmer that before this is all over, he's going to have to go to The Hague. He's going to have to go to the Intergalactic Court of Justice. I mean, that's a case that's, <laughs> you know, you know, they, they, they just don't, you know, they, they can't come up with a decision, and every decision they come up with, they, they, they pull back. And now what the judges are saying, especially the district court judges are saying, is, whoa, wait, you know, the Ninth Circuit is constantly arguing about what this means, and anything that remotely has anything to do with guns, even non-Second Amendment cases that have something to do with guns are now being frozen pending Nordyke. So that's not something we were uh, expecting. We have other cases where we filed them a very long time ago and they haven't been decided yet. Um, nothing we can do about that. It's a weakness of our system that we're not uh, able to, to force courts to decide the cases before them. And, and if the judge wants to sit in the case for, for a long time because they're busy uh, or for whatever reason, then there's, there's really not a whole lot we can do about that. So you, know, you file cases that you think are going to go quickly and they don't, and then other cases pop up suddenly and move quickly, uh, and things go back and forth. So I, I really can't predict which of these cases is, is going to go when. I can tell you where the cases are at now. 
uh, the New Jersey case, which I'm sure most people here are, are most concerned with, uh, I believe the opening brief there is due April 9th. Uh, uh, Hightower, which is the First Circuit case I'm handling uh, out of Massachusetts. Uh, that one, uh, we filed our opening brief. It's, it's uh, um, uh, the other side got an extension. They're going to answer that uh, also mid-April. Uh, we have um, uh, a case in the Second Circuit out of New York also. Uh, uh, it's our turn, our reply is due April 3rd. Uh, we have uh, the Moore case out of Illinois. Uh, that one, our opening brief is due March 19th, uh, and, and so on and so on. And uh, again, these cases are finally starting to, to get some traction. Once you get out of the district court, then they go on a more regular schedule, not entirely linear, but the district court is, is the place where you start out, and that's the one where you, know, you really don't know when you're going to get out. Once you are in the Court of Appeals, they are pretty good usually about moving things along uh, in a more structured way and so that things uh, start to proceed somewhat more rapidly. We're still waiting for decisions in other cases uh, and we'll see, but I have no idea which way the ball is going to bounce there. If I knew that, you know, <laughs> play the Powerball or something. Uh, question asks, the cop admitted one needs to shoot and kill a perpetrator and the uh, law enforcement If they don't have a warrant, you know, sure, you get a warrant. You know, uh, if they have a warrant, then they get to search your house. Right? Uh, was there a reason that you went after DC first, or was that by chance? Not by chance, very much by design. Uh, there are a number of reasons to go after DC first. Um, the three reasons primarily. Uh, first of all, DC had the craziest law in the country. In DC, you needed a permit to carry a gun, and the law said if you carry a gun without a permit outside your house, it's a felony. If you carry a gun inside your house, it's a misdemeanor offense <laughs> without a permit. And so that's why he had to have his permit in the house. The, the DC Circuit decision makes clear that, uh, that Heller is not seeking a, car uh, a carry permit for outside the home, and the case doesn't go there. Um, and then the third thing that, that was unique about DC that was worth going after first is that the DC Circuit, remember we have these federal courts of appeals, was, uh, was an open circuit. Arguably, it was even in our favor. We made actually that argument. They had an earlier case that, that suggested it was an individual right, although they, it wasn't that strong a statement, and many people saw it as at least an open circuit. All the other circuits, except for the second circuit, I think, had already, um, had already opined. And then, of course, uh, another reason it was important to us is that this was a federal jurisdiction. We didn't have to deal with uh, the 14th Amendment issue about whether or not uh, the right applied to the states. Obviously, that required McDonald. Obviously, even after Heller, there was resistance to this concept uh, such that we couldn't get out of the Seventh Circuit and only won McDonald 5-4. Uh, and this illustrates something else that's important as we do these cases. You know, we try to make them as small as possible. We like to have narrow cases that will have a broad impact by establishing a broad principle from a, from a narrow position. If you ask for everything, you're going to get nothing. Uh, it, you, know, you, you do have limited pages, limited words. Courts don't want to get a phone book. You know, and, uh, uh, the brief can only be so long, and it's not even always a good idea to use up all the words that you are allowed because short you know, is always better, less is more. If you have too much stuff in there, you're going to lose focus, and the, the, the courts aren't going to be able to, to handle all of your issues and they will not give each issue as much consideration as it would want. Uh, we were just trying to establish the individual nature of the Second Amendment right, and for that we really needed a very narrow case, one that dealt with the very basically rotten laws that we had in Washington, D.C., and left other things for later so we could build on, on that concept. Uh, I've seen Second Amendment cases since Heller um, that have not been as successful as I think they could have been had they bitten off less than, than, than they tried uh, to do. Thank you. This was an interesting question, uh, and I'll have a follow-up to this myself. Do you handle other cases, for instance, non-Second Amendment cases? And my follow-up to that is, when do you sleep? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, usually at night. <laughs> um, or the day, whatever. No, but I, yes, I do. I mean, you know, 
when I started this, I mean, Bob Levy called me up. This is how I got into Heller. I get a phone call from Bob, who I knew socially from, from other things, and he described the case that was being planned, and he asked if, if I was interested. And I said, yes, of course, it sounds like a great idea. Well, the reason he called me up is because I had a civil rights litigation background. The Second Amendment's a civil right. Uh, there is no uh, Second Amendment uh, lawyer part of the phone book, okay? It's not that big a field. Um, and yes, I do handle other things, uh, mostly in constitutional law these days. Uh, I have, um, I can, I, I'll just describe really, um, this is a two-way event, so I'm not gonna bore you with all my other cases, uh, but I'll just give you two very short examples. I'm wrapping up, I'm, it's a district court case. Uh, I'm challenging a campaign finance law, um, uh, suing the FEC on behalf of the Libertarian Party. Uh, they got a phone call one day that a very, uh, a donor had left, had died and left them a donation in an amount exceeding the campaign uh, co the finance limits. Uh, you can only give so much money to a political party every year. What happens if a political party receives a bequest from somebody who dies and leaves it a lot more than the, the federal limits? Well, we argue that um, uh, the deceased in this case is not trying to associate with the party. They're trying to express themselves. And, uh, <laughs> And, and, and so you have to look at it not as the associational way that courts look at, at campaign laws, but also as a, as a uh, uh, more as a um, speech case. And uh, in fact, there is no quid pro quo possible. Uh, the decedent is gone. They can afford to uh, uh, irritate him as much as they want, so long as their religious views don't think there are any consequences for that. Uh, it's not something that campaign finance law should reach, so I'm arguing that Campaign limits shouldn't argue to bequest. If you want to leave it all to some party, you should do that. Uh, I have a case in Michigan now I'm pursuing. This has been successful already to some large degree. I represent a local brewer whose beer uh, was banned because the state of Michigan's uh, Liquor Control Commission didn't like the label on the beer. And uh, they thought it was offensive and immoral and uh, bad for people to look at. And we uh, explained that there's actually a First Amendment in this country and they don't get to ban the beer because they don't like the label. Um, the, they, they, um, they saw the light, they rescinded the ban, but we still have an action for damages that's open, so uh, that's something. So yeah, I do other things as well. And, uh, Very good. Yeah. Um, Volkov wrote a law review describing a method of scrutiny to be used regarding gun laws. Could you? Volk, yeah, Eugene Volk. Gene Volk, yeah. Okay. How is criminal law confused? I mean, the scrutiny that you could try to gun laws. Could you explain it? Does it work? Yeah, well, Eugene Volk, obviously a brilliant uh, uh, professor at UCLA, writes a lot about Second Amendment issues, wrote, uh, has written a lot in the field, and he has one um, article I think that's being referred to. Uh, I know the article. Uh, I agree with, with most of it, not all of it, but most of it, and I think it's, it's a, it's a, all of it is useful and, and good reading. Uh, and um, again, uh, courts, when they get constitutional cases, are, have been programmed over the years to look for these so-called standards of review. Uh, uh, they really want to see whether or not uh, a regulation of a constitutional right uh, is, you know, meets some level of scrutiny. They always have a test for weighing the individual interest in the right against the governmental interest in the regulation. And the tests are believed to be outcome determinative. That is, once you agree what kind of a test you're going to get, the result will often flow from that. So there's been a lot, there's a lot of fight about which test do you apply. If you apply a really tough test, the outcome of that's going to be a good one for the, for the plaintiff, for the individual. If you, apply, if you apply a very deferential test, then the government's usually going to win. Now, it's not a perfect um, uh, result all the time. The government does sometimes win strict scrutiny cases, the toughest standard. Individuals do occasionally win, very rarely, uh, the low levels of review, rational basis. But for the most part, the tests are important. So there's a battle to apply um, you know, the toughest test possible for the Second Amendment, or the other side, of course, wants the weakest test possible, uh, because that will determine those cases to which the tests are applicable. And uh, the first thing that I, I would say is, you know, from our perspective, we want to have as little as possible be decided uh, under such a mechanism. 
If you can answer the question according to text, history, and tradition, then that's the way you should answer the question. If the Constitution says you're entitled to do something, that's it, okay? The, you don't then say, well, you know, on the other hand, you know, some professor doesn't like it. You know, that's, you only, you only uh, do that in those cases where the history doesn't uh, actually command a result uh, or it's unclear uh, uh, how the framers would have looked at it. And at the same time, of course, it's very obvious that there's a, a Second Amendment uh, right implicated. Now, what the courts are doing uh, is something very interesting. Uh, the trend now uh, is that the courts say, mm, Second Amendment, okay, you know what? Uh, rather than reinvent the wheel, we're going to just do what, what's been done for the First Amendment. And we're going to say that there isn't a one-size-fits-all standard. The standard of review is going to be uh, different depending upon the nature of the case. And so if you have a case where it's a core aspect of the right that's being claimed by law-abiding, responsible people, we're going to apply a really tough test. The government's going to have a hard time. Uh, if, however, you have a uh, peripheral claim, something that's thought of as being a little wacky perhaps, or more easy to say the people making the claim are not law-abiding, not responsible, then we're going to apply a lower level of review, although even there, uh, the lowest level of review they'll use is something called intermediate scrutiny. They won't go all the way down to the bottom. Uh, and uh, mostly we've seen so far uh, intermediate scrutiny because the courts, while they've announced this, they haven't had too many cases where they've actually had to uh, apply the, um, uh, the test in a circumstance where it would be uh, a core right being asserted by law-abiding uh, responsible people. The one area where they, they sort of did was Ezel. Uh, the court uh, in that case, the, my gun range case in Chicago, said, um, look, we've previously used intermediate scrutiny for dealing with criminals, uh, people who are domestic violence misdemeanors. Uh, but these are law-abiding people. Using a gun range is a core aspect of the right, and we're going to require something much higher than that, uh, if not quite strict scrutiny, definitely something tougher, and Chicago uh, should have gotten the message from that. I suspect they will in the next round. So again, it, de it, it depends on the facts, uh, but, but courts, so long as they keep saying they're gonna follow the First Amendment, that's a good thing for us. You know, The First Amendment, not perfectly interpreted, but it's a fairly robust right. I mean, courts do really enforce it uh, more than once in a while. And uh, if we can get that kind of treatment for the Second Amendment, we're gonna be in good shape. Well, um, I guess they're in politics, or... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, I, I can't really give legal advice to anonymous people who submit a card um, you know, telling you how to argue your case, so I can say good luck. I mean, I, I'm not sure how... I'm, I mean, I, I, just, I can't give legal I advice under that <laughs> circumstance. Okay. And then it'll be up to you if you'd like to take uh, additional questions from the bracket. Uh, do, you, do you ever pull other attorneys for advice? And if so, who and for what? Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, look, I don't do this all by myself. Uh, you know, I always uh, uh, frequently work with, with other people. Heller was a team effort. McDonald was a team effort. Um, uh, most of the cases I, I do, uh, I, uh, I work with other lawyers, sometimes informally, sometimes formally. Um, uh, part of it is uh, speaking to, well, there, there are two kinds of people that I've worked with in these cases. The, what I would call people who are subject matter experts, people who are perhaps attorneys but more likely scholars. Uh, you know, if somebody has spent a lifetime reading musty old documents in the courthouse basement somewhere and otherwise uh, gathered, you know, original information, that's a very important person to consult with. Um, you know, uh, and, and I definitely rely upon 
uh, people who, who've done that, whether they have a law license or not, um, and upon the literature that's been developed by, by those individuals. Uh, and then, of course, there are, there are people who, who uh, whether or not they have that kind of experience, are also good lawyers and, and know something about the, the, the business of, of law. And, um, uh, and sometimes people who've got both kinds of experience to, to various degrees. Uh, some of these people, their names appear in, on a briefs along with me, or they go to court with me, and sometimes they're not. Uh, they, they, they don't, but uh, at the very least, I cite their work. Uh, no, this is not something that I, I can do all by myself or that I've uh, um, invented entirely. I would like to say, though, that, um, and, and, and this is, I, I only hesitate to give you names because I don't want to leave anyone out. So with the understanding that, that some people might be left out, uh, not intentionally, I can tell you that you know, David Jensen has spoken to you earlier, somebody I work with, David Siegel in Chicago, David Hardy, not everyone's called David, by the way, uh, uh, David Kopel, um, you know, uh, but uh, you know, those, are, those are people that I've, uh, I've worked with. Uh, another David who's been very good, uh, David Young, uh, written a number of books about the, the, the Second Amendment. Not a lawyer, but uh, he's, he's better than that. His books are exceptional, and I think they, they have a lot of good original research in them. Um, uh, I, I, I don't want to leave people out, um, but um, you know, if, if, I, if, I, if you're out there watching and listening, and I've left your name out, then send me an angry email later, and I'm sorry. Um, but, but this does raise another issue, which is, I think, probably the biggest danger we have in this, in this field, which is, while there are people out there, uh, not just me, other people who are very good at what they do, um, Don Kilmer, excellent lawyer in California, sorry, I didn't want to leave him out, so okay, Don, don't send me an email. Um, while there are people out there who, who, are, who are very good uh, and, um, uh, and are doing good work, there are also people who are should probably find other hobbies. And you know, this is the problem we have. Uh, there is nothing that prevents an angry person who has gotten riled up, uh, you're reading the internet or something uh, late at night, from walking into a court with 350 bucks and filing a lawsuit. Um, that is not a good strategy for success. You've all heard the adage about if you have, if, if, you're, if you are your own client, you have a, you know, what for a client, and um, you know, I, pro se cases are not the way to do it. There are um, definitely uh, arrogant lawyers out there. Maybe I'm one of them. I don't know. But there's nobody more arrogant than someone who is uh, delusional enough to think that a, they can do this all by themselves, representing themselves oftentimes without the benefit of any sort of um, uh, legal experience or, or background or training. But those people do have their cases heard, of course, and they wind up coming up with, with uh, decisions that we all have to deal with. Not every case that deserves to win should be filed. There are strategic considerations to be made in all these cases. Uh, not everybody makes the best plaintiff. Not everybody is qualified to represent themselves, but uh, this is a, a serious issue for us. We've, we do have people out there doing this who, um, really are not remotely uh, uh, qualified to, uh, um, uh, to do it, and they, they do cause damage. That's different than other lawyers with whom we may have a disagreement, you know. Yes, lawyers disagree with each other, that's fine, that's normal. If another professional differs in their opinion uh, from mine, that's fine. I respect that, we're, you know, not everyone's gonna agree on everything. It's very different than some lunatic out there going and, and making uh, a kamikaze type, uh, type effort. We have that in this country and that's, that's a, a problem. Nothing I could do about that though. Nothing. I have another question about the agency. I just want to please ask every, when we're finished, don't turn right out. I just have a few words that I'm going to, uh, that I need to say before you leave, if you don't mind. Um, and uh, Ellen, there's, a, there's one last question here. It says, uh, once my uh, application, this is an interesting question because I think a lot of people Again, probably not. You know, this is the thing. You know, right now, let's talk about New Jersey, okay? There is a case now uh, from New Jersey in the Third Circuit, the Pizzatoski case, okay? That case is going to be decided 
one way or another, and whether it goes to the Supreme Court, some other case on the topic probably will. Um, but in New Jersey, if you were to file a case now in district court, if you had the best possible case and you were going to go to court and file it, chances are you're going to run into a very hostile district judge who is going to make a bad decision before the Third Circuit's going to have any, anything to say about the case that's already up there. That is, you're mathematically eliminated from being the decisive case because you're behind on the calendar. Okay, there's this other case ahead of yours which will become the controlling case. So why go to court, file a case, probably not get necessarily the greatest result that will then be cited at us on the appeal. Uh, and we, we are seeing that in some places and there are cases out there that are you know, what I would call late filed. And, I, and I, I would say to those people, and I have said to some of these people, look, I'm sympathetic, you're correct, you're a good person, you don't deserve to have this happen to you. But there are, you know, a half a dozen cases already in the Court of Appeals. Many have been fully briefed. Some have been argued. You know, why are you going to bring another one right now in the same jurisdiction? It doesn't make sense. And it's not a good use of our resources, so I'm not going to be able to devote the very limited resources we've got to taking on the umpteenth case on the same issue from the same place. Again, one of the things that we have to think about. Um, to some extent, you know, we, uh, well, to a complete extent, we have to put our best foot forward. And to some extent, we are also in a race against the various clocks that are out there. Uh, the courts may or may not be improving for us. Uh, we have uh, you know, crazy people out there filing things. We, we definitely want to make sure that um, they, don't, uh, they aren't the ones that, uh, that, that get adjudicated first. But we don't want to you know, just do things because we feel good about doing them. Uh, you know, again, remember, it's not about whether you're right or wrong. It's about what can you do to win. And, and uh, that requires sometimes more caution. Thanks. Thank you, Jerome. That, that's very important for Thanks. us. Thanks. Uh, you know, there's uh, you know, a number of people who have asked that question today. Uh, before we go any further, I want you to, you've been up there for quite a long time. You've sure. answered a lot of questions. I, I don't want to keep you up there any longer than uh, need be, but I just give you the option if you want to take any further questions from the audience. I'll take one more question. That one right there. You're your fastest hand up in there. <laughs> Okay. Well, uh, it's a complicated story. If the case is still open, if they were just arrested and they're waiting trial, then the, the decision applies. Uh, when the Supreme Court announces a, a legal principle, that is the principle that is effective for all future cases, but also for all cases that are currently existing. If somebody was convicted, um, you know, five years ago, ten years ago, if something that gets struck down then they have other options in their jurisdiction. They might, the courts there might be able to entertain uh, what's called the writ for quorum nobis. You can go in and, and say, look, this was an unconstitutional principle. Or if that's not available to you, perhaps uh, you, know, you might need uh, uh, habeas relief if you're still in jail. You might um, uh, have an expungement available to you. There are different options available. I'm not qualified to give that level of advice. This is a general question, but people who have been convicted of something that's been since struck down should consult with an attorney to see if they have any options. They might have options available to them. For people that are still awaiting a resolution, that's good. That's good law for them right now. So. Yeah. You know, you can't make up for everything. It's true. I mean, you know, some things are, you know, you're never going to you know, it's sad, it's true, yeah. But, you know, although I think all the prohibition victims are probably, you know, not with us. Okay. Thanks. On behalf of uh, the board of Thanks. Thanks.